The show is brought to you by Rudus Metal Detectors, makers of the Alter 71. Discover new possibilities at rutus.com.pl. The show is also made possible from donations from people and companies like yours. Please head on over to gdapod.com and uh, click on the top right button and go to the Make a Donation and help us out. It really does help us create a better show for you guys to listen to. In 1798, two boys exploring a small island called Oak Island off the coast of Nova Scotia discovered something amazing. Ten feet in the ground, a platform of oak logs. Another ten feet under that, more and more and more and more. Even today, people are currently still trying to dig up and find out what the secret of Oak Island is. Our guest today, James McQuiston, the author of three books, thinks he knows what the theory is and what may be lying underneath the ground on Oak Island. Is the connection on Oak Island to several families from Scotland, the Knights Templar, and the Freemasons from Edinburgh? We'll find out. The theory seems to be the most detailed and thoroughly researched theory on what could be underneath the ground in Oak Island. And James McQuiston is adamant that he is on the correct path. Listening to his story, I couldn't just leave it in a single episode. I decided to go ahead and make the entire two-hour episode a three-part series. For those of you who don't know what Oak Island is, this is a great place to start. For those of you who follow the theories of Oak Island and love the television show on history, The Curse of Oak Island with Marty and Rick Lagina, this is a place where you will definitely love to listen to a brand new theory. Our guest has been on the recent season of The Curse of Oak Island, sharing his theories with Rick and Marty Lagina himself. And I'm happy to include him on the Global Discovery Adventures podcast, our guest, James McQuiston. I had a really good talk with James, and uh, like I said, I'm not going to be able to just cut this into a single episode. Uh, there's way too much theory, too much diving into this. It's a great, great show. You guys are going to love this, and um, you know, there's just too many uh, cooperating facts that show that this might be the actual and true uh, discovery of what is going to come on Oak Island. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and be quiet. I'll get in touch with you guys after the episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you give us a like, review, and uh, I'll be back with some more news right after our talk with the great James McQuiston. Let's do it up. Uh, there will be a special, we're going to create an Oak Island page just for uh, sharing some of this information and uh, maybe I can even get uh, our guest this week, a uh, <laughs> great guy, James McQuiston, who I've been talking with for a little bit, uh, so I finally get a chance to just sit down and talk with him one-on-one -on -one about this whole thing, because like I was saying before, if you don't know what the curse of Oak Island is, uh, you've probably been living under a rock recently because it's one of those things that's become kind of a pop culture icon on television because it's the whole question of is it, isn't it, and it's personified on a small speck of an island just off the Nova Scotia coastline um, in an island that nobody would have looked twice at, and it seems like there's a secret that this place is hiding. Uh, my guest today is a author, historian, and like I said, author of three books on the Curse of Oak Island, or on Oak Island, Oak Island, Oak Island Missing Links, Oak Island 1632, and Oak Island Nights. He spends a lot of time uh, with uh, Marty and Rick Lagina out on the island itself, and uh, have has uh, postulated quite a few hypotheses himself and come has uh, kind of come to his own conclusion what he thinks the truth is of the island itself. Uh, now, uh, 
James, uh, like I said earlier, but this time we're going to just nail this, get this over with. I'm too sick and tired of the other thing. Um, Thank you, first of all, for coming to GDA and coming on to the show. This is an important subject, and I love talking about this. Well, I'm glad to be here, and I have to say that I don't – it probably was not a coincidence that (laughs) we both went through some agony here getting this hooked up because I was just telling you about the curse of Oak Island really being how things go wrong and equipment fails and all that, and I had – and it's a it, island in my hand, a little uh, drill piece, and I was just about to show you. So I, we couldn't have been closer to Oak <laughs> Island unless we were there when uh, everything went down. But so we're just uh, this is just a bit or an audio stream. At this yeah, point. this is an audio stream at this point. Uh, we will share. Um, I will get some photographs from you, and we can share these items uh, right on the website so people can okay. see it. So. Uh, just to, to recap a little bit, I, I've i written a number of books, and I had written a lot of, most of what I write about is Scottish history. Uh-huh. And even if it's a book about somebody in America, I always link it back to their Scottish roots. So uh, back in 2014, my work was recognized by a couple of Scottish historians, and they nominated me for a fellowship with the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. That's and amazing. What that is, is it's a group of historians that was first founded in 1780, and they work with the Scottish National Museums, and they work with uh, the Scottish National Records. And uh, so I was approached uh, with this fellowship, and I had to go through about a three-month uh, testing period, that you might call it, or whatever. But eventually I was made a fellow. Mm-hmm. So... Um, the advantage that that gave me was that I was able to go to them when I had specific questions about Scotland. And if they couldn't answer them, they would send me over to the Scottish museums. And if they couldn't answer, they'd send me to the Scottish records. So I had an awful lot of people over in Scotland, a lot of historians helping me. And in addition, the two people that I mentioned originally, uh, the, the other two historians that nominated me, one of them, had a video from a gentleman that had passed away, but he was considered the expert on the Knights Templar in Scotland. Oh, wow. And he sent me that video. It was quite a couple hour long video. <clears throat> and then um, the other gentleman, he, I was working with him uh, in uh, recognizing a battle that took place and it's right, at rightful place in history. And uh, one of his friends had, uh, gone through all the official documents of Scotland to find every record he could on secret societies. And while well, secret orders, not so much like the Freemasons, uh, but uh, like the Knights Templar and the Knights of St. John and all that. And so he had written up a report for their group. And so this gentleman sent me a PDF of that. So here I am getting all this great information. This was even before I even thought about Oak Island. This was just cool information I was getting. So I was writing a family book. I was actually rewriting it. And our family holds the title of Premier Knight Baronet of Nova Scotia. And the person that actually holds it, his name is Sir Ian MacDonald McQuiston. And McQuiston is the Gaelic form of McQuiston. And so, um, and I emailed with him a few times, but I had no idea what that was even about. I just knew that he existed. So uh, as I was writing the book and and I was rewriting that part, I was also independently watching The Curse of Oak Island. <laughs> and I'm sitting there one night and I'm thinking, uh, you know, Knight, Baronet of Nova Scotia, Oak Island, Nova Scotia, maybe they have something to do with each other. So I wrote them and they uh, set up a call uh, with Paul Troutman for about an hour. And we talked about what I what little bit I did know about it. And he asked me a ton of questions. So I started answering questions and the people I was answering to expanded out and eventually included Doug Carroll, who then kind of picked up the ball. Once they realized that this wasn't just another crackpot bit of information because they get so many theories there, it's unreal. And so, and not all of them are crackpot, but (laughs) 
a lot of them are pretty sketchy and they don't come with a lot of backup. So after hundreds of emails, they suggested I write a book, and that was the first one, Oak Island Missing Links. And that's more generic of how easily it would have been to actually sail over to Nova Scotia from the Norwegian countries or the British Isles, uh, because you have several stepping stones on the way. You have the Faroe Islands, Greenland, New, uh, Iceland, Newfoundland, before you get to Nova Scotia, whereas when Columbus went across, he went right straight across 3,800 miles with no place to stop. They only had to go about 2,000 miles, and they had five places they could stop on the way. So uh, part of it was that. Part of it was uh, an interpretation of who I think the Micmac uh, legend of Glooscap really represents because it's been said that that's Henry Sinclair and it's pretty hard to get the name Glooscap out of Henry Sinclair, but it's not very hard to get it out of the name that I came up with. And also in the Zeno narratives, which are a description of the Zeno brothers who supposedly had helped a Scottish prince sail over to the new world. uh, They called him such many. And I came up with a phonetic and historical uh, interpretation of who Zichmini might be. So those are in that book. I also identify a couple of items from Scotland that would be invaluable if they were ever found. They're, they're both lost right now. Hmm. And I also did uh, a considerable pair or a chapter on the Knights Templar. So that was what the first book was about. But it didn't narrow anything down. I mean, I was slowly narrowing it down. So by time I'd sent a few more hundred emails to Doug and particularly to Doug and Rick, yeah. became my point people, Rick Lagina. Um, they suggested another book because I had narrowed this down to what I, who I thought the people were and what year, which was 1632. And so uh, that was the book they asked me to come up to Oak Island in in 2018 to talk about i'd been there in 2017 to talk about my first book and i was in the war room and as a matter of fact i hold one claim to fame that nobody else will ever be able to claim because i gave the very last uh uh, presentation in the old war room and i didn't know it was going to be that but after i did my presentation uh we were outside standing around and i thought well i'm going to go back in the war room and look around a little bit and there was a lady in there photographing each section of wall and then taking everything off it. And I said, what's happening? And she said, I'm taking everything down to the new war room, but it's top secret. She said, <laughs> and I said All right. so what I found out was that, uh, first of all, that was just an old shed that was converted and it was not in good shape. So they were concerned of bringing guests in, yeah. you know, something was happen- would happen. Secondly, it didn't have good air conditioning and they had a lot of artifacts and articles and photographs on the wall. And they were concerned that, um, these might get ruined if they could, they needed to get them into a, a better controlled environment. And third, the old war room was right across the causeway when you drive over to the Island. So if they were in the middle of filming and a bunch of tourists came over, uh, got out, yeah. a bunch of noise, you know, so they built a, somewhat identical war room i think it's just a hair bigger but it's up around the bend and you can't get to it except through a gate and but it's got good air conditioning and the ceiling is higher where the lighting can be better because they really you know we went through a lot here today of me trying to set up my studio (laughs) in my office and everything well they were they were somewhat hodgepodge in the old war room and this allowed them to get better lighting up in the rafters and everything so it was a considerable improvement but anyway so that was 2017 they did not use that footage although everybody on the oak island team uh was kind of enthralled with my ideas so um in 2018 i went up and we were working, Doug and I were working on a project uh, about a medallion, which I'm going to tell you about. It's a, it's a pretty exciting development. Yeah. But, uh, so we discovered a lot more about it and we eventually got the gentleman who found it back in the seventies to show it for the first time in public. And he showed it to just me and, uh, Doug and Rick. And my wife was in the room, too, and she was taking photographs like crazy. We were in the war room, and Prometheus, 
couldn't get a team down there because it was Saturday morning early and they'd worked a long week and they said their crew was scattered everywhere. We didn't know the guy was coming. He just called up and said, all right, I'll come down and show it to you. So we all scrambled to the island. <laughs> and uh, and I tried, I, when I got there, Rick was on the phone with Prometheus trying to convince them to get a crew down there and they were telling they couldn't. And he said, he hands me his cell phone and says, here, you talk to him. So I'd only talked to this gentleman a couple times, and that was about boring things like car rentals and hotel rooms and stuff. But I said, you know, this is such a big deal. And he said, I, I, I'm telling you, it'd be four hours if I could even find a couple guys. He said, they work like 10-hour days for five days. They're gone on a Saturday morning. So he said, I'm, not, I'm just not going to find them. So uh, the gentleman brought it in and showed it to us. And I, I'll get into that in, in a minute. Uh-huh. But, so because we developed a lot of more information on that and because I was developing more information as I was heading up there and on my way back out because of questions they asked, I knew I had to write the third book. They had suggested the first two and they sell them up there in their museum. But I knew I had to write this third book because I came up with, I added to the who and the when, I added the what and why it was buried and why nobody could come back to get it. So I couldn't leave it out with just those first two books, even though they stand on their own and they've got a ton of information in them. I had to write this third book, and that's Oak Island Nights with a K. Mm -hmm. And uh, a local newspaper wrote it up as Oak Island Nights with an N, and I thought, well, people (laughs) are going to think it's some kind of romance novel or something. But uh, this is a serious book. And when you show it on the show, however you do end up showing it, on the front of that is the medallion, and that yeah. photo is the best photo taken of it. The only photo before that day, which was in 2018, was a Polaroid that was taken of it laying down on a linoleum floor, and it was so small you could barely, you had no idea what size it actually was. There's nothing for reference, and it was blurry, and uh, it had. they knew it had French writing on it, and they knew it was from 1671, and that's all Doug could tell me. Well, I went hunting the way I do into old documents, and I found that it was an Order of the Garter Knighthood medallion from uh, England, or Great Britain, actually, by then. And uh, there were only three given out that year. So I went on the search of where they all were. One was had been in Sweden, and it was stolen with a bunch of items and melted down for the gold and the silver, because it's a silver medallion. Yeah. I'm the like, other one I'm in the British now Museum. Yeah. The other one is in the British Museum, and the Swedish Museum was able to give me photos of it, even though it's destroyed. So I had the front and back photos of that. The British Museum gave me the front and back photos of the one there, and they know who those two belong to. So there was only one person left in all of history that this third one could belong to. Uh Well, he happened to be the financier of a treasure hunter. Really? And that treasure hunter found a Spanish galleon down uh, near the Dominica Republic. And uh, he went back to England to get financing. The king was, uh, he was under uh, pressure because he was Catholic in a, in a relatively Protestant environment. And he just didn't have a lot of money. So this other gentleman, his name was Christopher Monk, he had just retired from all of his uh, responsibilities and, and titles and everything just to live the good life uh, in his later years. So he decided he'd sponsor this other gentleman whose name was William Phipps to go find the treasure, and he did, and he brought it back to England. And one currency calculator says it was worth billions of dollars, and some stories about it say that it actually saved uh, Great Britain because they were so destitute at the time that it saved them well one of the things that this christopher monk had given up when he gave up all his titles was his uh order of the garter medallion okay so the so the thing was laying around basically phipps could not be knighted officially because he was uh, born in america and had no real property but he was knighted he was given an honorary knighthood so what i'm thinking happened because he took Christopher Monks and King James, billions of dollars, they just gave him the silver medallion and said, you know, that wasn't being used anyway, and said, here, uh, you're officially a knight now. 
even though you can't, you're not eligible to be one. Now you're a knight. So he came back to America claiming to be a knight, and they called him the New England Knight. And so he eventually went up to Nova Scotia to chase the French out. And he, the first place he hit was the place where my guys that I think buried the treasure were living. And he wrote in his book that he, he and his men were searching for plunder, which means stolen treasure, by land, by water, and underground. So he was there treasure hunting. He wasn't there just to chase the French out. His personal motive was to treasure hunt. And then the medallion was found uh, on the other side of Nova Scotia from there at the little town of New Ross. And I don't know if you've seen that on the show, but uh, about 20 miles up from Oak Island, there's an old foundation there that they've been trying to, they've been speculating who it belongs to. Some people said it was Templar. Some people said it was Henry Sinclair, whatever. Well, I found evidence that this other family that I'm going to get into had built a secret estate there. Huh. And this medallion was found with the, with the gentleman that was there with the guy that found it. He said we were playing a stone's throw over there from that foundation when he dug it up in the dirt. So my theory on that end of it, which doesn't pertain 100% to my overall theory, but it's just interesting because this is a medallion you can hold in your hand. It's an actual object, yeah. silver object, that can be dated. And my theory is that it's Fitz beautiful. came across Nova Scotia hunting for this treasure that he knew about. He may have got in a battle and it got knocked off his chest now two parts to that number one is at the uh admonishment when you became the knight was that you wore the medallion around your neck on a ribbon yeah so just to just to follow the rules he would have been done it doing that but he also led 700 men and so just like the boss wears a tie at work and the sheriff wears a badge when he goes out to arrest the bad guy well he was almost certainly wearing his medallion around his neck uh, as a, to show that he was the boss of these 700 people and also because that's what the knighthood said he had to do. Yeah. And the medallion is somewhat compressed on the front. If you show a good photo of it uh, to your listeners, yeah. see there's a drag. it's St. George slaying the dragon. Yeah. And the dragon's body is somewhat compressed yeah yeah it looks a little flat it looks almost like there's a double print on it almost well when you flip that over on the back side there's a dent and some of the lettering is smashed right in right there oh. so this thing uh experienced trauma somehow and fairly severe trauma because i don't think you could it, it, I, I don't know what my two ideas are that he was in battle with the French or with the Micmac First Nations tribes uh -huh. uh, because it was all wild country at the time. Yeah, of And he got hit with a club or something and fell off his neck and he couldn't recover it because he was in the middle of a battle and it got kicked into the dirt. Or uh, he just dropped it while they were searching for, quote, plunder underground, you know, and he just happened to lose it and didn't realize until and he didn't know where to look. But, you know, being a... Uh, metal detectors the kind of crazy stuff you find just laying in the oddest places yeah. and that this was just laying a couple inches under the dirt right off the side of this foundation yeah i mean i myself i've even found a uh a religious medallion from a knight's templar it was an old cross with the skull and crossbones on it in uh, the middle of a farmer field uh yeah. where there was no horse path at the time so i have no idea how it was there well, and, and that was the thing that was uh, bugging me so bad is how it would end up. I mean, once I identified who it belonged to, then I it was bugging me. Well, how did it get there? And then when I found out the gentleman it was originally given to was the financier of a treasure hunter who ended up becoming the governor of Nova Scotia and wrote in his own book that he was searching for plunder underground, it kind of all came together. Uh, and then, oh. yeah, to be found 20 miles away from Oak Island as well. Right. Uh, right. That's too, too big of a coincidence. Now well, it does, the, go ahead. Yeah, I was looking, I'm looking at the medallion. It looks like the, uh, the part where the ribbon would have gone through, it looks like it's been slightly soldered or reconnected up there as well. Or, yeah. And the thing is that 
the uh, three medallions all have a, a different kind of connector. The This one has this ring. The uh-huh. one in England has no connector at all. Really? And the one in Sweden had a chain that wrapped around the medallion and then had a link, couple links that came up to hook to the ribbon. So the chain itself was holding, you know, it was wide enough to actually hold the medallion within it. So, so they all they all uh, were whether that happened through the years or whether they were originally done that way. But one thing about them is the fronts are absolutely identical on them all because I took them in the Photoshop, which I I spent years in Photoshop. Yeah, put them all on top of each other and they all land exactly on each other. Huh. But the backsides are slightly different, and I think what happened was they minted the fronts and. Uh, and a piece of ivy around the outside on the back for maybe 10 years worth of them. Cause they didn't know each year how many nights were going to be necessarily inducted. So, and then they would go in an imprint when on the day or, before, you know, shortly before the day that they would install them. And they always install them all on the same day. All three of them would come or their proxy would come and the King would put the sword on their shoulders and all that. And yeah, come at night well the the inner print that had the date and all that was slightly off on the backs of all three of them so even though they're identical metal for that year they're not identical because of that slight skew of the type compared to that ivy ring so every one of them would be an absolute one of a kind in history even though you know even though they looked identical it it, makes it slightly easier to identify which one belongs to who as well yeah so the kicker for all of this, just for this part of the story, and believe me, this isn't my main theory, but it <laughs> kind of supports it, and this is where it gets into supporting it. The gentleman that was given Nova Scotia in 1621, his name was William Alexander, and uh, his personal secretary, who wrote down all of the, hand wrote all the documents that pertained to the Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia, and the whole attempted settlement there uh, was a man named James Philp. Well, William Phipps' father was named James Phipps. Uh, James Philp disappears from Scotland in 1640 when Alexander dies. He sold his land and left. 1640. 1640. And shortly after that, James Phipps arrives in Maine, which is just across the water from Nova Scotia. Mm Mm-hmm. And so I looked up the Phipps and the Philp name, and they're both just contractions of the name Phillips. They're essentially the same name. And so it could be the same person. And there's no further record of James Philp in Scotland, and there's no uh, previous records uh, earlier than James Phipps in Maine. So both men disappear from their respective countries in a way, or one disappears in one country and another one appears in the other country <laughs> within a few years. And William Phipps goes looking for the Alexander treasure. So uh, it, if that isn't what really happened, there's one hell of a bunch of coincidences. Yeah. And there's no other story. There's no Nobody else has any story about how this all ties together at all. There's nothing out there because, believe me, I spent almost three years now researching and this is all there is and it all comes out of documents that's what i love about it is you know people can disbelieve me and say i'm just another quack or i'm looking for my 15 minutes of fame or trying to sell books or whatever but i put the documents in the book i i I, in most cases i don't reproduce the entire document because first of all it's written and whereas and tither and all that you know from 1600s you know drive people nuts but I put in the pertinent part of it that tells the tale, you know. And yeah. so if somebody doubts me about it, all they got to do is go back and look at the document. And they can look up the full document online and read the whole thing if they want to and and see where I got it from. So that's what I think makes mine stand out from a lot of them because there's a lot of speculation um, and maybe a lot of wishful thinking. And I'm not picking on everybody because, 
you know, everybody that puts out a theory thinks they've got the best theory, of course. You of know, course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Put it out there. But when we were walking down from the new war room back to the museum after my talk in 2018, it was just Rick and I walking down, and he said, uh, yours is the best presentation we've ever had in the war room. And I said, oh, really? And he said, he said we get so many theorists here, and he said they have a theory, but they don't have any evidence. And they give us their theory, and then we sit and look at each other and think, well, what do we? What should we even ask them? We don't even know where to go from here, you know? <laughs> yeah, and you and do see said, that a lot on the show, too. He said, you came in here for two hours. You gave them a two-hour presentation with all this documentation and evidence. And he said, I don't see a way to blow a hole in it. So, uh, boy, you got to believe I was thrilled to hear that. And, you know, when when you're in the filming, first of all, you're – you're, you can only focus in one place at a time. You don't see the camera's view of, of the room, and you're trying to absorb everything as it's happening. But when I watched that final closing scene uh, on when I appeared on Curse of Oak Island, I was on on April 9th, and the final scene, Rick was saying all these great things about it, and I knew he had been saying something nice, but I really couldn't have repeated it to you right afterwards. But I they showed him and then they showed Doug Kroll and then they showed Charles and Charles meant as, as much as anybody, because he's been doing this forever. His family lived on the Island. You know, in fact, some of his ancestors actually, you know, signed legal documents as witnesses for the original three guys that found the money pit. So for him to say, and you back it up with facts, you know? So when I watched that again, because I filmed it when it was, you know, I couldn't help but get my iPhone out and film each section when they had me on there. Um, and then when I replayed that, I thought, wow, that is so nice because I really didn't I really didn't absorb all that at that moment in time. It wasn't yeah. until I watched it again eight months later or what, however many months it's been that I thought, wow, they really uh, seemed to like it. So anyway... So uh, to get off William Phipps and Monk, uh, and there, that story goes on and on and on. Believe me, there's so much more to it. But I just tried to hit the high parts of it and, and the high parts of the medallion. But uh, I, I want to jump back to Sir William Alexander. Yeah. So, what happened was the the French had settled up in this one area called Port Royal, and that's on the leeward side of Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia isn't an island, but it almost is. And the leeward side is much calmer, but the windward side is all jagged from the Atlantic waves hitting it and the storms and all that. So naturally, you'd want to settle on the leeward side so you wouldn't get beat up. So they settled there in 1605, and they were attacked a few times, but they there were still remnants of them being there. When the people came over on the Mayflower, the Puritans, um, there were three ships, I believe, that came. Uh, eventually, but they settled um, the Plymouth Colony, and their title to the Plymouth Colony included Nova Scotia, even though they didn't have possession of it, but it it was written that it did. So they were upset that these French Catholics, because this was in a time period when, you know, Protestants and Catholics were killing each other right and left and torture and everything, just incredible time. Yeah. So uh, they wanted those Catholics out of there. So they uh, made an appeal to King James the First, who was he had been James. Well, he still was James the Sixth of Scotland. He was the son of Mary Queen of Scots, and when she was uh, uh, killed by Queen Elizabeth out of jealousy, and then when Queen Elizabeth died without any children, James was the natural person to take over for England. So if, well, everybody thinks England took over Scotland. Well, in a sense, Scotland took over England because King James came down from Scotland and became King James the first of England and Ireland as well. And he's the one that actually coined the expression great Brittany, uh, but they didn't use it for a while to describe the country, but he, in his own writings in 1605, he coined that expression. <laughs> so, uh, they petitioned him to do something about the French up there. And they didn't call it Nova Scotia. They called it Acadia or Acadia. Yeah, and uh, so uh, he went to his good friend William Alexander, who had followed him down from Scotland, and he was on his privy council, and 
he held a, a gazillion titles in government and eventually was named Secretary of State for life. So he was a very powerful man. And so he approached him and said, do you think you could get some of our fellow Scotsmen to go over there and take care of this? Because Scots were known at that time particularly as mercenaries. They were fighting all over Europe as, as, and in Ireland as mercenaries. Yeah, they, they were, and yeah, yeah. So uh, they, he said, well, we've got a new France, a new England, and a new Spain. If you give me this territory of Acadia as new Scotland, I'll do it. So the king said, okay. So they wrote up a charter in Latin, and New Scotland in Latin is written Nova Scotia. So that's how the name came about, and that was in 1621. Well, it was a barren land except for the Micmac First Nations, possibly one other tribe, and then the small group of French people living at Port Royal. So... um, Alexander sent his first ship over in 1622, and it never made it there because of a storm, and it it floundered in uh, Newfoundland. So in huh. 1623, he sent a second ship, and they picked up 10 survivors in Newfoundland, and they went on down to Nova Scotia, and right down below Oak Island and New Ross, about 70 miles below it, they established a little colony called Lukesboro because their ship was called the St. Luke, so they called it Lukesboro. Okay. And it didn't it was short lived, but sixteen twenty three is the year that three different sources say that a secret estate was built at New Ross for William Alexander. And that's the secret that's the foundation up there where the medallion was found. Twenty miles north of Oak Island. Right, right up Gold River, of all rivers, right up Gold River. <laughs> Hopefully well, a good sign. The, the sources are the Alexander family themselves. They moved out eventually. They got forced out by Cromwell, but and they formed Alexandria, Virginia. But okay. that's one source. Another source is a family by the last name of Noss, N-A-U-S-S. And I actually talked to the man who made the comment that his ancestors helped build the um, secret estate there. He was a little bit reluctant to talk too much about it, and he actually made the comment that maybe the Lagina should be speaking to him instead of me. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> but he did he did uh, uh, agree that he was the man who made that comment. And then the third source was uh, a Micmac uh, First Nations member who told the landowner at the time that his ancestors had helped build the secret estate in 1623. So the point is that three different sources, that, and they're disparate sources, number one, but one of them's down in Virginia, they all make the same claim. It would be kind of foolish not to believe it, because we have a foundation there that nobody can explain, and we have three different groups of people saying, yeah, that was William Alexander's foundation. So... Um, uh, they re- they returned, or some of them returned, but they left left their ship behind. They left the Saint Luke behind, so that tells me they left some of the settlers behind too. And then uh, they got a load of fish, and they loaded them onto other boats up in Newfoundland and headed back to England on those boats. So um, Alexander was finding it hard to get anybody to agree to go over there because it was barren and. Uh, you know, there was danger involved between the French and the Micmac. So um, he devised this uh, uh, knighthood called the Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia, mm-hmm. which my family holds the premier knighthood right now. And uh, the idea was that you would, for a certain fee, which was uh, currency calculators drive you nuts because <laughs> it all depends on what you're, you know, if you're basing it on gold. If yep. you're based on land, on average wages, or the biggest influence in the economy, and how they explain that. I mean, I'm going to give you the latest explanation, but if you're a millionaire in the United States, you're one of many millions of millionaires. But if you're a millionaire, say, in Bangladesh, you're going to carry a lot more weight. Your yeah. millions are going to be worth more, even if you went to Mexico or Honduras or whatever. You know, they're going to be worth more. So if you base it on that kind of a currency calculation, it jumps it way up. So the uh, fee for the uh, for this knighthood, because you had to pay a fee, was ranged from uh, 
in the range of thirty to fifty thousand using some lesser calculators up five hundred thousand. Wow. But regardless it was a big chunk of cash to, to become a knight. Well the other thing you had to provide were six men of good of standing. They had to be like a blacksmith or a minister or uh, a serious farmer or something. They didn't want broken men because that was one of the big problems with Scotland at the time was that they had broken men all over the highways robbing people and sleeping in the big towns, you know, and begging and all that. And they wanted to, he wanted to create a utopia. Well, no, Andrew, it's all spelled out in my book. Yeah. Um, the whole thing about his idea for this utopia. That's Oak Island Knights book. No, yeah, that's what I was just about to ask if that was Oak Island Knights. But Oak Island 1632 also has an awful lot of background information. And I would, I would recommend if anybody wants to read deeper into this, start with Oak Island Knights and then work backwards. Because you'll see, uh, uh, once you understand the big story, then you'll get the details as you go backwards into the books. So and you'll then you see, see how, how it all ties together. Yes. Okay. So, um, so. Uh, and I know this gets complicated. I'm trying to keep it as simple as I can. But no, it's good. They they did create the knighthood in 1625, and people started signing up. Well, what was what Rick? The, one of the questions Rick asked me uh, in my uh, six in my 2017 visit was, "Are there any connections to the Knights Templar?" And I said, "Well, I know there's some, but I never really went down that route." So when I got back, I looked into it, and overall, of all the knights that signed up, which is uh, like 120, roughly, about 25% of them have some kind of link to the Knights Templar. But, more importantly, if you only looked at the first couple dozen that signed up, they all had links to the Knights Templar. So I realized then, well, this is kind of a, in a way, it's a spinoff. It's like the heirs of the Knights Templar became the Knights Baronet. But where it really gets crazy is that William Alexander's two sons, William Jr. and Anthony, became the world's first two Freemasons. Huh. And his partner, a guy named Alexander Strachan, and I, I always refer to him as Al Strachan because it gets to be too many Alexanders in the story. <laughs> but Al, Al Strachan became the world's third Freemason. And the Edinburgh Lodge number one in Edinburgh... Uh, has the actual document still, and I found a, a facsimile of it, and it has their signatures on it. It was July 3rd, 1634, and there's a big story about how they got in as what they call them non-operative because they didn't operate as a stonemason. It was a stonemason's guild until that day, and these gentlemen were not stonemasons, and there was a political reason why they got in there, uh, but... Uh, they became what is the what we think of today as a Freemason, and it was only three years later in the same lodge where they started using the name Freemason, the word Freemason. Mm -hmm. So now you have a tie between the Knights Templar, the Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia, and the Freemasons, an absolute tie. So I started looking at all these families, and I did a lot of that in 1632 where I could find a Knights Templar, I, in the same family, I could find a Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia. Then I could find a Freemason. And in one family, the McLean family, it even goes a step further because John Smith, who was one of the three guys that found the money pit, his mother was a McLean. Well, the McLean family, there was a Lachlan McLean, who was a Knights Templar. Later on, there was a Lachlan McLean, who was a Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia. A little later on was James McLean, who was the second Grand Master of the French Freemasons, when they when the Scots were helping the French set up their Freemason lodges, and then a little later on you got John McLean Smith out Oak Island finding the money pit treasure. So the connections are just incredible, and they continue even today. Uh, I sent some more stuff out to. I have a, a mailing list of like six people now, uh, principal people, three Oak Islanders and three Prometheus people, where I send my research as I'm finding it because I, I want them to be up to date on what I'm finding. And uh, some of it I can't talk too much about, but yeah. it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper to where there isn't any doubt in my mind that the fix was, well, I have to tell you about the treasure, but the, a treasure was stolen. The fix was in to steal the treasure 
It was taken to Nova Scotia to finance Nova Scotia. Alexander was going to set himself up as the king there. The French took it back over, and Oliver Cromwell was busy in Great Britain trying to get rid of all royalty. Yeah, and yeah, Harry yeah. Alexander was the he was the best buddy of the king. So they found themselves between a rock and a hard place. And I believe they, I have quite a theory, but it, it's very believable and it's backed up by some science, including carbon dating and weather records. They were forced out in 1632. They got there in 1629. They were forced out in 1632 by the French in April. You could not have sailed across the North Atlantic in April. You can't even do it today but on most days because if you look at the NOAA weather records for it was April 27th was the day they absolutely had to be gone by. You look at the weather records for April 27th for 2017 and 2018, they had waves 35 feet high. They had um, high winds. They had fog and they had freezing spray. And the freezing spray is what would take a, a ship down because – I don't know if you ever watched the deadliest catch where they go out yeah. and catch the crabs. Those metal boats get covered with ice, and they take a wooden bat and go out there and break the ice off. Yeah. Well, if you were trying to do that to a ship from the 1600s, you'd beat the thing to death. <laughs> Plus, you couldn't, you couldn't take, you know, because the NOAA even said that some waves can be higher than the, twice as high as the norm. They gave the norm as 20 foot. So they're talking about a rogue wave could be up to 40 foot. Well, there's no way at no. Uh, those ships, they had a draft of about 12 to 16 foot, and there's no way that a 40-foot wave, or possibly even a 20-foot wave, wasn't going to just dump them right over. Yeah, especially even if they were pointed nose first right at it. Yeah, and they knew they were, uh, they had, they were forced to take everything with them, or they were allowed to take everything, mm-hmm. I have to say that, because it was a semi-friendly evacuation, although some Scots stayed behind and fought, but, uh, they were told in the order to leave uh, to take everything, including their gold and silver that was specifically on the list, which was interesting. And all their cannons and rifles and all that, they were allowed to take it all. But if you can imagine, they're on the leeward side of Port Royal, and the weather's reasonably okay. You know, it's early spring. You come around the bottom of Nova Scotia, you're, the first thing you're going to see is the Atlantic. Yep. The terrible storm. You head up the coast of Nova Scotia and the deepest bay, which by deep, I mean deep into the land, not necessarily deep down, but deep into the land is Mahone Bay. And at the back of the bay is Oak Island. Oak Island is near the shore. Some people think it even had a natural causeway back then. You can get water. You can dig for water on it, fresh water. Really? Okay. uh, It just happens to be right below the secret estate up at, at New Ross. So of all, and they had given that land to uh, their only French ally in, in Nova Scotia, which I can tell you about that in a minute. But so there was no better place for them to go to wait out the storm than to go to Oak Island. It's it, And so people say, well, why Oak Island? Well, if you look at all the evidence, you'll see why. And my story, the Alexanders were finally forced out by Cromwell in uh, 1656. Hmm. So the time period I'm talking about essentially starts at 1620 with the Mayflower people, but uh, more importantly, it's 1621 when Nova Scotia was founded. It, it, it goes on up to 1656 when the Alexanders finally left. Well, I took the carbon dating records for uh, wood that both Fred Nolan and Dan Blankenship, you probably know those two names, uh, two old timers, uh, the early records they sent in for carbon dating, and uh, they ranged from way back in the 1500s up into the 1700s, but if you put them on a bar graph, the only place they all crossed over was 1620 to 1660, exactly my time period. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, Exactly. And there's no other place where they do cross. No, There is no other record that shows a concentration of carbon dating rec- uh, dates that equals a somewhat traumatic time in Nova Scotia. And so to get back to what's buried there, 
and I'm going to reveal a lot of that's in my book, but, but believe me, there's a hundred times more in there, and there's all the details and the other books, like I say, give the background information. So if anybody's truly interested in this, the first book they would ha- would need to buy is Oak Island Nights, because they're going to get a story that's never been told by anybody before, except for by me, from me. But um, so in 1620, uh, first of all, if you look back at all the records about Sir William Alexander in Nova Scotia, he complains constantly about not having enough money. And uh, so for his adventure, not for his personal use, but for his adventure. And so his ship failed in 1622. He didn't get a he didn't get a ship all the way there till 1623. Mm-hmm. But in October of 1622, this is the whole key right here. In October of 1622, his partner, Alexander Stratton, or Al Stratton, as I call him, yeah. the world's third Freemason, steals a massive treasure from one of the richest people in Scotland, and he steals the guy's wife along with it. <laughs> well, he is tried... But he's not tried before a jury. He's tried before the Privy Council. Well, William Alexander has been in the Privy Council for many years at this point and essentially runs it. His trial is delayed two more times. So over a one-year period, it was set for three different days. It was never, ever held. The following year, right as the Knights Baronet were being established, Al Strachan and all the other people involved were given complete remission for their crime. Huh. So nobody went to jail for stealing this gigantic treasure. And the where I found the treasure was in the history of Lodge Number 1 of Freemasons in Edinburgh, and in their book. Was the treasure yeah. ever recovered? That's That was my next question. Yeah. So I went to... Well, everybody, that is the end of the first part of this three-part series on the mystery of Oak Island. Uh, please head on over to the Global Discovery Adventures website. That's gdapod.com and find images and information on our very own Oak Island page that will be opening up really soon. You can also find out when we will be having live shows on the calendar that's right there on the homepage. It's a really great page. A lot of information, a lot of discoveries and everything else on there. Please head on over there. Now, if you guys are liking this show, like I said at the top of the show, please head on over to wherever you get your podcast that could be at at um, iTunes that could be at Spotify that could be at Spreaker iHeartRadio Google Podcasts wherever it is that you listen to this podcast and please 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 leave us a rating leave us a review give us comments let us know how I am doing how we are doing uh, myself 42 producer luke and producer dave would love any kind of feedback from you guys and like i said this show is made possible from donations from people and companies like you if you want to be part of the gda family please head on over to gdapod.com and find on the top right a button for donations every single penny helps us out it helps pay for all these costs and fees and everything else Uh, we do this out of love for the hobby the love and everything else we do if you don't know what gda is global discovery adventures is a group on facebook that has hundreds and hundreds of active users we discover and find and metal detect and share information and stuff we find in a very friendly way this is a friendly no harm website and group nobody is allowed to talk smack or anything else please feel free to head on over on facebook and find us there uh, the music today is called Shetland. I hope you liked it. Uh, tried to throw something together that was uh, pretty nice. Uh, they just happened to have it on GarageBand, and it fit the show today. So really, really big thanks to uh, GarageBand for having such a great show. Uh, but that's it. We'll see you guys next week. Uh, this is Lance Goolsby, founder of Global Discovery Adventures, uh, an American living in Germany, crazily enough. And uh, we'll talk to you guys next week. Yeah, I hope you like the show. Until then.